We're the last philosophers. Everybody now that talks is reading from a pre-approved script. You know, even our alleged smart people, you know, are, are corporately controlled, you know. So there's only one group of people that kind of say what they want to say, stand-ups. I think it's wonderful that at one end of the, the social side of society, there's this crowd of nutters who will talk about having sex with your mother and, and dying and salt and clouds and running about naked <laughs> and talking about venereal disease and cancer and politics. I think it's only poetry that comes up to the same esteem. It's beyond art. It's a magic trick, you know. Real magic. We're asking a room full of hundreds of people to have an involuntary physical response simultaneously. It's fucking weird. You want to please the audience because that's why you do stand-up, is because of some fucked up need inside of you to, to have approval by strangers. I have to get on stage. That serves a valuable purpose in my life. That's what I love to do. It's my, it's my muse. It makes, it calms me. It puts me at ease. I don't, I can go on stage and just talk about anything and I get an immediate response. When you're a comedian, your author, your director, your actor, wham, it is either full approval or full disapproval on your essence, on what you actually believe and how you really see life. Jokes are meant to be told no matter what. In the, in the eye of the storm, you gotta tell that joke. You gotta tell it because you wanna, you, you wanna be dangerous, you wanna be you wanna move you know, the, the needle. The fun is that when you risk and it scores, it's hallelujah. The first time you go on stage, you have no idea how harsh an environment it actually is. And because when you watch comedians, when you don't know anything about it, it seems like the audience is kind of having a good time anyway. And this guy comes on and he says some funny things and then they have an even better time. That's what it looks like. That's not what, what's happening at all. Uh, what's happening is nothing. Absolutely nothing. It is dead, solid, quiet room of unhappy people. And you have to start from that. Do you remember an early time when things went really well? No. And I'm always jealous of these people. The first time it was amazing. Mine was a horrific experience where I believe I left my body and wet myself at the same time. I don't think that's even possible in like a motorcycle accident, and that happened. <laughs> I had written all this material, I forgot all of it, and I immediately went into this kind of like shutdown mode, and I was babbling, just basically babbling, like a shell shock, like, but, you know. And afterwards, you know, the crowd maybe gave me a couple of pity claps, that was it. And I remember just like in a fetal position in my bed, and my mom going, what's wrong? And I'm like, I'm good at nothing. I remember telling her that I can't do anything. I just kind of fell into it because I would watch the amateur nights. I go, these people are horrible. You know, if they can do it, I can do it. And then I went up there and I was worse than them. <laughs> I, mean, I was up there and I started, like I didn't even know how to speak English. And I still remember just making noises. Like, because I didn't even know what to do. You know? I couldn't even get through what I had planned to do, which was only about five minutes of things. 
I was so shocked and rocked by the density of the air in the room. And you feel the mood of the room. It's just this cement block. And I just, I just left that night and I was devastated. There was about six people because it was raining and I just died on my ass and some guy yelled something like, go back to school or something. It was something really flimsy like that. Anyway, I, in the rain, we drove back and my dad went, yeah, well, you're, uh, you're good at a lot of different things. This is, uh, this probably isn't a thing for you, but if you enjoy it as some type of hobby, then uh, yeah, it can't hurt really. You know, it could hurt your self-esteem, sure. I go to audition for Lucian, and uh, I, I kill. I thought the set was amazing. You know, he's, he was a comedy club owner, and these guys would watch you, and then they take you in the back and tell you if you can make work in that club or not. I go into the back, and I'm sitting down. I'm like 21. I'm like, hey, man, I just want to say thank you. This is cool, man, that, uh, you know, you let me come here and uh, audition. He talked like this. He's like, well, Kevin, um... I didn't see it. I didn't see it tonight. So I'm like, see what? What are you, what are you talking about? Potential, he says to my face. <laughs> Potential. I don't think you have what it takes to be a comedian. I said, God damn. <laughs> to my face? It was very, very early in my career I became aware of the power of laughter. Actually, I thought I was a folk singer at the time. And I was on stage with my banjo, was so fraught with nerves that I forgot the words halfway through. I was playing, I was playing it quite well and singing quite well, and then suddenly the blank came. I thought, oh, Jesus, what am I going to do? And I, so I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the words. And I, so I started to tell them what the song was about in my nervous way. And they started to titter and laugh and scream. And it ended up they were roaring with laughter. And I thought, oh, I like that noise. I remember the first time I was aware of how it felt to make people laugh, and that was I was at college. And I started doing these funny voices and half routines, very kind of uh, ill-crafted stuff, and they laughed a lot. And, I, and I, I'll never forget that feeling of making a crowd of people laugh, because when I went off stage, I just remember thinking, that was so exciting, that felt so good. I really, I have to do that again, I want to do that again. And then I spent three months and I wrote a whole new set of things that I thought were funny. And I got on stage and I got the whole five minutes out of my mouth. I knew to be more prepared this time, you know, that you have to memorize it like ice cold. And I got through it and the people laughed and that was the greatest night of my life. stand-up comedian starts out emulating another comedian because they know that works but then another night you let a little bit of you out and it gets a laugh then you let a little bit more of you out and then pretty soon you're you on stage it takes your act 10 years to form to gel you want something that is comfortable to you and you have the greatest comfort and latitude with things you don't have to feel like a thief about. When you can use your own stuff, that's the forever fountain. But it's only over a period of, of, of many, many years of growing as a human being and being on stage and developing material where you really can get a sense of your own voice and your own identity. And you could really start saying, that's my material. That is born of who I am. My first time out, I did three minutes that were great, but I, I did it as Jesus' brother. Instead of saying, imagine Jesus' brother, I was doing an imitation that I was Jesus' brother. And it didn't work until the last minute I said, maybe not even the last minute, I said, no, this was hilarious this, this morning in, in front of a mirror. And everyone laughed. And then right then I, I 
I understood at that moment something that the one honest moment got the laugh. I went on stage trying to do this material that I had written, and I ended up insulting this poor little woman in the front row by calling her Florida Evans because she was bald headed. <laughs> she looked at me like she wanted to fight me. And I guess that fear of like, oh my goodness, what have I done? I just started just talking about girl, I'm so sorry. Look, I was bald headed because I had a bad perm once, and I put it in, and all my hair fell out, girl, because I understand. And everybody just started cracking up, and I realized comedy's real. I'm telling them something that really happened to me to try to get out of someone wanting to fight me right now, and that's what I realized what my funny was. My funny is real, my funny is truth. Why would an audience want to hear what I've got to say? Why would I want to sit down and watch a bloke I've never heard of and hear what he's got to say about his life? <laughs> but then I started talking about my family, you know, talking about their experiences of being in England and talking about how it feels to be a young black kid doing, and I found this, this voice, this inner voice of me, a truth, if you will. And what it meant was that I could say something quite provocative that would make people laugh, but then also think. I like that. A lot of comedians just want laugh, 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 laugh every, what is it, 15 seconds, they say? Uh, I like laugh, boo, laugh, <gasps> you know, gasp laugh, get out of here, disbelief. Like, I like to mix emotion with laughter. Emotions must not get in the way of the work, but allow it to join the work. And then you'll say things and do things that are coming from here, and your audience will know that. They'll know when it's a set joke, and they'll know when it's coming from your heart. You share those two elements together with your brain, lock it in, and go nowhere without it. I have the system, which I read about, uh, has been Seinfeld system. But then I sort of Googled it and I can't find any trace of it, so it could be like a dream that I had. But uh, apparently the idea is that you write uh, three jokes a day that you're definitely going to do on stage, which sounds like nothing, right? Three, but you've definitely got to say it. So on the first day, you find yourself at half past ten at night still not having written the third or possibly the second or first joke. And you're like, I can't go to bed because I've not done it, right? And that's so horrible that by the fourth day, you've kind of got in a system of going, oh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do it every day. And then when you get on stage and you start doing them and they're terrible and you have to do them, you start to go, oh, I'd better make these funnier. I would call my sister and I would say, oh my God, I went home with a guy last night and he had like the biggest penis and I bailed as soon as I saw it and left. And uh, and I'm telling her over the phone and, and we're both crying laughing. And, and I was like, oh, she's like, you should try this on stage. And okay. And then, so it became just talking to my friends or family in life and then seeing how that translated to the stage, finding the punchlines in it. Like I have a joke that I write at least once a week, I write it out to see if it's come to me yet. And I can't. I still have never made it work. I've tried it on stage a few times with two, a couple different setups, and I can't. How long has that been going on? Yeah. That particular joke has probably been in the works for five or six years. But there's other jokes that I have that I've tried to make work for longer than that, you know, 10 years probably. So there are people who sit at home and write out the jokes, and then there are people who take concepts and go on stage and talk about them. Um, and, and those guys tend to be more in the moment. I was about to go on a month ago at Largo and I was like, I don't feel funny, I don't feel funny. And, and I was like, what am I gonna do? And, and everything I thought of to do was fake. So I didn't feel funny. And then I just went on stage and I was like, I don't feel funny. And it was good. If I run into something that happens, immediately I'll pull out my phone and start typing, texting. And my wife, she knows. He's, he's writing, he's documenting for the stage. And she'll be like, uh-uh, you're not taking us to the stage. I'm like, the hell I'm not. I just jot him down. So in here, 
you see how long this is. These are just random thoughts, random joke thoughts for my next hour. Anytime I have a, a funny idea, I write it in my phone. So then I have a, a bunch of strange notes that maybe I don't fully understand. I don't know what I want to talk about. I don't know the order of it or how it goes. So what I do is, to start my next hour, to start building an hour, uh, me, Harry, and Joe will go to a comedy club. I'll take my phone, I'll look at my notes, I'll just start talking. Call the law offices of Bender and Bender if you want a lawyer with an Indiana Jones hat. Uh, your engagement doesn't count until you post the picture of the ring on Facebook. Family tighter than a white pussy. So that's kind of fucked up. I shouldn't have said that one out loud. I literally started four and a half weeks ago working on a new act. I literally didn't even have a premise that I wanted to work on. And I walked on stage and just talked to the audience for 45 minutes to an hour. And then little bits of things would show up when I would talk to this person. So they would say something and I would say something. And I'm like, I could say that again. I could say that again. And then, you know, you cut to four and a half, five weeks later now, and I've got about 40 minutes of, of an act. I will go to the whitest city, Boise, Idaho, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Gunnison, Colorado, and do my blackest material, do an hour of black material. If they knew 20 minutes of it, I would take that and log that and say, okay, I know that any white, middle America place where there's no blacks, they understand this 20 minutes. Then I would go to like the chocolate city, Chicago, you know, uh, New York, Miami, LA, and do all of my political, you know, stuff. And then if they knew 20 minutes of that, we just lock it together. So I know now 40 minutes of wherever I go, people are going to uh, know what I'm talking about. After I'm happy, I'll go do like a small theater, 1,500, 2,000, and see how, see how people are receiving it from me being far away, because I need my material to come off intimate, even though it's not intimate. I'm a storyteller. But within my stories, there's hills and valleys. So I need that to always be intriguing. I don't ever want there to be a dull moment, because when you're in an arena, it's so large. The minute you lose people's attention, they start talking. That talking can, it can gravitate towards your stage. It can fuck up the whole environment. So everything needs to be a smack in the face. The nice thing about stand-up, you get to do your act over and over and over. And, and the audience that is, is laughing at, at a joke has no idea of the countless audiences who had to suffer through it before. <laughs> it's like you write with chalk. And you don't know, that's billions of little animals that died a horrible death. <laughs> Comedy is purely a result of your ability to withstand self-torture. <laughs> that's, that's where you get great comedy. Your ability to suffer and go, that damn thing still doesn't work. I gotta, I'm gonna write it again. I'm gonna try it again. And if you're willing to do that 85 times for a stupid joke <laughs> over the course of many years, great jokes get written. Do you still write your yeah. jokes out in full? No, I never, I, you know, I don't know how, I look at my act, what I, what I like to call the act, like it's this monument. Sometimes I go to the act and I pray there. <laughs> Dear act. <laughs> If I may implore you to give me a, is it so much to give me a little joke? How about a Jew walks into a bar joke? Anything. <laughs> How about everybody that was ever in a joke is in the bar? How about that? The most complicated joke ever. And then the farmer's daughter comes in and she's still Comedians, in my opinion, are Jedis. They play mind tricks on people. And the best comedians put an entire crowd in like kind of a trance. So the entire group is thinking as one and thinking in that comic's mind thought process. And that's why when somebody messes up a line, it's almost like the record screeched, you know? And everyone comes out of the trance, and then he has to put him back into the trance. And that's how you get crowds thinking in rhythm 
with your act. And that's why the great comics have a rhythm to their act. I would always sometimes say, you know, how many of you are in this magnificent arena for your very first time applaud? And they would applaud. I'd say, how many of you are seeing Frank Sinatra live your very first time applaud? And they'd applaud. I'm in charge and you're, I'm gonna question you. The first thing I'm gonna say is a question to you. Here's the point. I talk, you react. I talk, you react. I talk, you, I got him into my rhythm. You know, this was my trick to get him into my rhythm, you know, and, and focus on me. So you're not seeking their approval at all? No, I'm seeking their sublimation. <laughs> yeah, like this guy's a little scary. <laughs> After every joke, I would take a step back because I was so afraid of the, the audience, you know? So by the end of my set, I'd be clearly against the wall, you know? And um, a friend of mine said, you, you know, you do it and, and you start eating it because you disconnect from the audience. So what I started doing is I used to start walking toward them. And then another thing that I started doing is to look at everyone in their eyes. I would think that what happens between uh a comedian and an audience, I was tempted to say, stays with the comedian and the audience. <laughs> and I'm not about to let that cat out of the bag now. I feel every night I am linking up with everyone uh, there in the audience. So I'm trying to entertain myself. So I enjoy that show. That's the trick. I've always tried to keep that. I keep the stuff molten, constantly ready to move it, verbally sculpted into a, a place. But each night I'm slightly re-sculpting it. Um, less so because I found that I keep re-sculpting it and you get it good and then you keep re-sculpting it and you go, you've lost that, those good bits. So I'm, I'm trying now to sculpt it to a place and then kind of set it with the wiggle room. You know, when the zombies are coming, you just got to keep shooting. Reload. You know what I mean? And eventually, yay, the show's over. And people go, you were great. And you go, thank you. And you go, was I? Every audience is different. I think you should be nervous. I think that there should be some anticipation of, oh, my God, are they going to like this one? Is it always going to hit? Um, because then you get bored. Um, I don't like being nervous, especially before a huge show. I hate that. I'm going to throw up. You know, I want to use the bathroom, I want to throw up, I want to quit, I want to pull off my hair, throw it in the audience, I want to, ah! You, you go through all that until you hear your first laugh. And then you're like, oh, I am so funny! Yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> Shake the toilet, did you jiggle the toilet? Handle? Okay, just gonna walk through the scene. Did she just walk through my, yeah, it's, great. it's great. All right, close the door. This is so ghetto. I apologize. <laughs> I was in a clothing store and I'm walking around uh, primarily looking for a shirt, just so you can understand my intention in this story. And a young man comes up to me and he says, uh, Mr. Shanley, can I talk to you a second? And uh, I said, uh, sure, what's up? He said, you know, I, I, I've only been in L.A. like a few months, and I want to do stand-up comedy. I said, right. He said, well, there's got to be a secret, right? There's got to be a shortcut. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I know I hear about guys having to go to work in clubs, and they'd have to do this, and they do this, and it's all about the work, and you got to go and try jokes and write jokes. and this, this. But there's always a shortcut. I said, no, there's no shortcut. There's literally no shortcut. To be a comedian means you have to go out and take your comedy to the people. And not just do it in the places where it's glamorous. You got to go to those places you may not necessarily want to go to. So they sent my little ass to cold ass Minnesota. Hey, what'd you think of Minnesota? Uh, it's fucking cold. You get out on the road and it's absolute pure hell. city 
and then you'll have just sadness for miles. Just hours of nothing. Nothing! And it's the same. They haven't put up anything. My first couple of years on the road were going with whoever would take me for $50 to despicable comedy clubs in basements or in attics where the green room is just like a bar and they take half off the onion rings for you. Just horrible hotels, crossing highways, you know, just uh, being excited that they have free yogurt and orange juice in the lobby. So you're driving through these states, you're driving 10 hours to your next gig. And then you get to this gig and they put you up in some motel that people have been murdered in, 100% guaranteed they've been murdered in. They put you up at the hotel room that's got nothing but blood stains with chalk around them all over the carpet. And then they guys, I don't know what it is about this room. Anyway, click, you know. So you're there just awake all night. And you hate yourself because your dinner is out of a vending machine. Because it's either that or some scary fast food drive through place. You're like, you're going to eat at a TGI Fridays every day. You're going to get to know the staff. Like, you're going to be at that place so much. If you eat well on the road, you just lost money on the flight. <laughs> like, you're going you're gonna to come home 100 bucks in the hole because you decided to have fish. You're taking a person that suffers from depression. You're like, hey, go, go get in a room in a city where you legit don't know anybody. And you're like, hey, hang out by yourself for four days. The amount of loneliness can be insane. Sometimes the audience are the first people you've spoke to in a day. It's eight o'clock at night, and they're the first, that's the first human interaction you've had all day. It's lonely. You know, I can be on stage in front of 5,000 people, get a standing ovation, and go to my hotel room to complete silence. And I'm looking at the money on the bed and the room service I just ordered, but I have no one to call. I mean, yeah, you have just weird times out there where you have to share a room with some dude you don't even know, and a lot of times it's like an adult man. And that's scary, some dude who's in his 40s who still doesn't know if he's bisexual or not. And you're just like laying there in a bed next to him, just facing the other way, just like, oh shit, how does this end, you know? I mean, that kind of stuff can get a little bit spooky, you know? Because you know how fucked up you are, and you know that he's 20 years further and fucked up. You're like, dang, son. This is how the chain keeps going. This is how the torch gets passed, you know? And you get a lot of sleeps in places that you wouldn't have thought it would be technically possible to sleep. So like a, a leatherette, two-seater couch. You might get a good couple of hours sleep, and that's a bad sign when you're peeling your face off a vinyl surface <laughs> 10 minutes before you talk to a thousand people. The road is really lonely, and uh, it only feels good when you're on stage, and it doesn't always. <laughs> and, um, and you make friends just that you will never see them again, but just for the night, the crew that's there, whoever's working there, the waiters, waitresses, and stuff. And, and then you're on a plane or a car or a train the next day. There are places, clubs, and entire cities I swear I've never been to.
And then I get to the club and I see I've signed their wall. And that's the way I know I've been there. This thought comes to you, which is, I'm insane. I'm going to a place I've never been, to a town I've never been, and I think I can make these people laugh. I think that we have something in common. It seems crazy. The hardest part about the road is just feeling disoriented. And if you're not careful, that slight feeling of where am I, what am I doing, what am I connected to, that slight feeling can get a lot worse. You'll have some glamour gigs, some Vegasy gigs. Then you'll have just some brutal road stuff where they didn't advertise right, and the owner's like, oh man, sorry about the small crowds, but the gun show is killing us this week. Then you gotta get up on stage, and it's in a bar where they turn off the TV as it's the bottom of the ninth of the World Series. And they say, are you ready for stand-up? And everyone screams, boo! Turn the TVs back on. It's the bottom of the ninth of the World Series. Are you ready for a chick that's ovulating and she's moody and cranky? And then you're finally done and they hand you a check and you go, all right, I'll do it again tomorrow. You always want to be in an environment where people are coming to see you. There used to be a strip club in Alaska called PJ's. This is when they were building the Alaskan pipeline. Now your audience were a bunch of, a group of men. First of all, in Alaska, you can carry a gun, like on your hip. In addition to that, they have been in the Alaskan wilderness working for six months. They have not seen women at all. They come to this place, they've got money like this and a bag of Coke, two guns on the hips. That's who you're playing to. And then they announce you instead of sprinkles. <laughs> you talk about hostile. <laughs> that was a hostile audience. The second you walk on stage, they are judging you. They are judging you. And if they find something they don't like, Say you uh, have on Mitch Mac socks, that could be the death of your stand-up night. Look at you with your little Mitch Mac socks. Like you get, people have no filter. It's not like, you know, when you go to the opera or whatever, and I don't go to the opera often, but I, <laughs> I suspect there's not a lot of heckling <laughs> at the opera. <laughs> you call that falsetto, motherfucker? That ain't falsetto. That's whack. There's no other form of public speaking that has hecklers. You never see anybody heckling TED Talks, do you? You've never watched a TED Talk be like, what if I told you I devise a way to feed every child on this planet? Fuck you, dork, who said that? Friday's second show is always a slapdown show because first show, they're not drunk enough to be mean about how much they hated their work week. But by second show, fuck whoever is on stage. You're in for a beaten man. They, and they hate you because you're well lit. You're slightly elevated from them. And their subconscious just switches you with the boss. And now they're shouting at the fucking boss. And you're babysitting, you know? I can never hear what a heckler's saying. I, I, I just respond wildly to them. And they may be saying, oh, Billy, I love you. And I say, shut the fuck up! I don't really like them as a species, you know, because it's like all that stuff about warming the audience up and all that stuff that people talk about. And if you do it kind of unconsciously, you start a certain way, you build it up. But what you do is you, you, there's 3,000 people in the room or maybe 400 or 200, whatever number there is, you get it to one. You get them all into one big forehead. And, and so I just speak to the foreheads, and it's one big forehead in the room. 
But when the, when the, the heckler goes, blah, 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 vroom, vroom, becomes 3,000 again. And I have to go gather, 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 get them all in like a shepherd, and then blah, 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 and they all go, and go blah, 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 blah. And, <laughs> and I end up doing the Tunnel Club in, my, in uh, London, which, of course, was notorious now long uh, since defunct. But that was like a baptism of fire. That was a rite of passage. You had to do the Tunnel Club. And I, I did it, um, and they literally uh, threw chairs at you. And, um, uh, yeah, chairs... I think chairs was like... Uh, meant they quite liked you because they weren't glasses. Because <laughs> you, you could dodge a chair. You know. That was actually... They thought, oh, they're, they're only throwing chairs. I, I, might, I might be able to, you know, win them over. There's a man about 65 years of age wearing a suit and a tie, grey hair. I thought, not my typical audience. He's got his hand up like this. And I went, yes, sir. He went, excuse me, jester. Not like, jester? OK. It's going to be like that, is it? I said, yes. He went, I've got a question for you. And I was like, OK, it's near the end of the show. What's your question, sir? And without skipping a beat, he just went, is there any truth in the rumour that black men don't go down on their women? <laughs> the whole audience. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, hold on, I'll call the others. <laughs> it's like, Winston, is Leroy there? <laughs> And I go, uh, anybody here uh, celebrate Hanukkah? And a guy in the back yells out, hey, you're a Jew? And I go, yeah, yeah? And he goes, what room are you staying in? <laughs> and I go, uh, excuse me? And he goes, I said, what room are you staying in, Jew? <laughs> and I go, a different one. <laughs> All right. I did a room in New York four years ago in a basement, incredibly uh, dark, not a lot of lighting, and n all black people. And I hadn't even barely said anything. <laughs> and a kid in the audience goes, yo, are you scared? <laughs> and you know what? I have a confession to make. I was scared. The guy in the front row uh, gets a phone call, answers his phone call. Everyone can hear it ring, by the way and answers it like he's in a helicopter. Yeah, yeah, I'm just here. It's a guy, uh, Yankee Doodles, it's a bar. Yeah, there's a chick on stage. Oh my God, it's painful. <laughs> I mean, my microphone is picking up his entire conversation. He's so close to the stage. And I immediately lean into this guy. I just go for him and he gives me the finger. He flips me off and for some reason that was it. I don't know why. I don't know why the finger, I fucking lost it. There was a guy who punched me on stage. Yeah, in, in Brisbane. He, he said, I'll never forget him. He said, my wife's ears are not garbage cans. I had told some risque story and he came on. And he obviously thought my chin came to the end of my beard. Because I had a big long beard and he went like that. In my <laughs> and I said, is that the best you can do? And he said, no, and nutted me. <laughs> and I went in my ass. And I was in, um, you know, Little Rock, Arkansas, and a dude called me the N-word, like from the stage, from the back of the stage, rowdy. You know, he was drunk and belligerent, but it was the kind of thing that, it, you know, it, it it made me so mad that I was off my show. Like, I could not get back to funny. Like, the club owner go, hey, what's wrong with it? You know, jeez. Like, Come on, do a joke back at him. Something, call him something, but that, can't stop the show. Hell, aren't you a nigger? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> You know what, I'm just gonna wrap my stuff up and get on out of here, guys. You know, like, this is not going well. I thought I had an ally. As much as I wanted to, to be the victim in the situation, in the world of comedy, it was basically saying that was unacceptable. Like, you could not cower out even to this guy's ignorance and his rude racial behavior. Like, you have to decide to do something that's gonna be the comedian in the situation. See, when you heckle me, you're trying to hurt my feelings. Just know I'm dead on the inside. I'm, this is burnt wood, man. 
I've been doing comedy for 16 years. My soul has been gangbanged by clowns. Do you understand? Like, it is dead and it is gone. There's nothing left in here for you to hurt. It's over. As someone that doesn't look um, like, you know, a kind of gorgeous model type, um, you get used uh, in the streets to walking along and getting abuse off people out of cars and out of vans, you know. And the thing about comedy was they're right there in front of you. And so I've sort of been storing it up for quite a long time, I think, wanting to have a go back at them. And um, I, I, I found it, like, really enjoyable. <laughs> I don't like hecklers, but I'm fascinated by them. And, you know, I don't have like bits for hecklers, but I just love going in and talking to, giving them the attention that they need so badly and talking about it, you know, and, and where that comes from and, and how can I help you? You know, how can I make you feel good about yourself? Another thing, way of controlling a room, which again can lead to fantastic deaths, but really enjoyable ones, is to treat abusive heckles as if they were genuine inquiries. <laughs> From the simple one like, why don't you fuck off? To answer that in terms of you're contractually obliged to stay there, you have financial responsibilities over and or ongoing with mortgage family, and that there, that there is a certain amount of time that you're required to fulfil. Um, to, to treat things as, as genuine inquiries, and um, and that that and, and actually to answer them at such length that the people regret having asked the question in the first place. Usually it'll be like maybe three back and forths, and then I can shut it down. They usually shut up, but if they don't shut up and they're like probably really drunk or whatever, then I invite them to the stage. So what would you like to come up here? Why don't you come on up here? Only one time have I had a heckler actually come up to the stage, and I hand them like I said, tell a joke now. Tell a joke. And then I ran down into the audience and sat down, and they started telling their joke, and I started heckling them all through their joke. <laughs> I was like, heard that. <laughs> That's stupid. You didn't say that word right. <laughs> they heckling them all through their joke. And then I came in, the audience is busting up laughing, and I come back to the stage and said, so how does it feel? How did it feel? Do you feel really funny now? Do you feel like you could do anything? They're like, hey, that was messed up. That's real fucked up. You was doing that. So, oh, so you don't like it when it's done to you. Do on to others as you want them to do to you. Get your ass off my stage. Audience are laughing, about 600 people, everyone's laughing. There's a table here with two men who aren't laughing. They're in the front, they're in my eye line. And I'm like, I'm gonna make, and I don't know why I said it out loud. I went, you know what guys, I'm gonna make you laugh if it kills me. They're laughing, doing something again, they're laughing. I went, mate, why aren't you laughing? He didn't say anything. The guy next to him said this, and it's a quote. Mate, he doesn't talk to niggers. That's what he said, all right? And this is the, in, in the noughties, this was, 2007 or something. And the whole audience was like, <gasps> and I said, you know what, you know what? This cotton-picking, grass-chewing nigger wants to talk to you. I don't care if you don't want to speak to him. And by the way, who are you? The mouthpiece of the non-nigger speaker. <laughs> you know, the whole audience, and I, I, and I never normally lose it on stage, but the gloves are off, and every single bit of arsenal in my head was like, bang, bang, bang. The audience are pissing themselves, no doubt, and people around that table are sort of doing that, and I'm going, bang, bang. And then at the end of it, I went, you know what? I'll tell you who's got the power. This nigger wants you out. Fucking get out. And the whole audience, out, out. <laughs> I consider this the greatest heckle kill of all time. I was doing a show in Phoenix, Arizona, and I talk about the time I got my ass kicked by my girlfriend. And suddenly in the back I hear, joke thief! I go, what? And she, this chick in the back goes, you're a joke thief! And I look back and there's this little desert rat. I don't know if you've been to Phoenix, Arizona, but they've been in the sun too fucking long. It's the worst combination of meth and sun you'll ever meet in your life. Just talking bacon, nobody's got teeth. This guy in the front row's laughing at everything, and every time he la he's got no teeth, he's laughing, I feel like I'm getting chased by Pac-Man. I look in the back, there's this fucking desert rat, about 4'2", tall, but big tits. She's like a tit midget. Just giant, big old bitty titties on this like little chick. 
but she's sitting on this giant white orangutan, this huge white supremacist fucking dude who looks like he thought like American History X was a comedy, like a giant fucking angry, like sas white albino Sasquatch. I go, lady, what are you talking about? That's a real story. I got the scars proof. She goes, no, that's Joe Rogan's joke. Now the room is quiet. I go, okay, how about this? I'll call Joe, and if he says it's his joke, I'll quit comedy. If he says it's not his joke, you have to come up here and let Pac-Man motorboat them tits, okay? <laughs> She's like, good, do it, but you won't because you're a joke thief. So I'm like, okay, I call Joe. It's a Friday night. The phone rings. He doesn't answer. I go, he didn't answer. Of course he didn't because you're a fucking joke thief. So only the phone rings, and it's Joe Rogan. So I answer the phone. I put it on speakerphone. I'm like, Joe, what's up? He's like, what's up, Triple E, you savage? I'm like, Joe, do you do a joke about getting your ass kicked by your girlfriend? He's like, nah, man. I'm Joe Rogan. I don't fucking get my ass kicked by anybody. I go, Joe, you're the best. I hang up. I'm like, hey, sweetie, time to pay the toll to the troll. You know what I'm saying? It's like, fuck you, you're a piece of shit. And she starts screaming at me, screaming at me. I'm like, lady, calm the fuck. It's a comedy show. I don't know where this other chick jumps up and she goes, I think he's funny and just whack <laughs> drops this big titty bitch. I was supposed to do 45 minutes that night. I'm 20 minutes into this set. I'm like, that's the best we get. I got to call tonight. Good night, dude. The audience is a group of wild horses. They're coming in from all walks of life. They're in there and all kinds of stuff is going on, you know. And so when you walk out on stage, the only thing you can do is like grab the reins and just try to ride it. Like just totally just try to like get it. Like, ah, everybody get in line. Ah, ah, like listen to me, I'm the guy. Because if you start to let people kind of go off on their own, next thing you know, this group's over here chattering. Now these, they, these people want to talk to them. Somebody tells that guy to shut up, and next thing you know, you you don't have the room at all. Like, and it's that fast. Oh man, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing stand-up comedy, whether you've been doing it for two years or 25 years or 30 years, you are never exempt from a bad night. Never. It doesn't matter who you are. You. We, that's the beauty of comedy is that you're not guaranteed to kill. You know that moment after a boxer sort of gets punched that he wasn't expecting and sort of has a little stumble. Well, that's the same as a comic when you, when you don't get a laugh that you were expecting. Oh, God, what, what's happened there? And a bloke on the second row, he goes, you can go home if you want, son. <laughs> I remember thinking, that is worse than being called a twat. Like, that is worse than someone saying fuck off. Like, it's the worst thing. A nice... Like a nice, like he's putting me out of my misery. He's not even, he's not a nasty bloke. He's actually a nice man. Then I can't, as a human being, I can't watch any more of this. <laughs> you know what I mean? As a man who, who has humans in my life that I love, I can't watch this train crash. When you hear in the back of a room, somebody go, mean it's so fucking mean and also the fact that it's a very light sound and if you can hear it that is a testament to the silence in the room <laughs> it's so brutal i've had 500 people in a room and it's been going so badly and that it was so much silence that at the back of the room i heard that was it <laughs> just and it just wafted all across the room one tut. Horrible. It's like the click of a gun. You know what's coming next? I remember an old lady came, came, walked to the front of the stage and said, why, why don't you go away? <laughs> it wasn't even a heckle. I don't think she had the strength to heckle. 
And I said to her, I remember, well, you'll never see another strawberry season anyway. And there was booing from the crowd. I mean, everything I did, I looked to the wings. There was the DJ, the owner of the club, and the guy who was at that time calling himself my agent, going, come on. <laughs> and I was thinking, now the next, the next gag will turn it round. One night, uh, Jim Norton threw a phone book at me at the Boston Comedy Club. Uh, he throws it, I'm bombing. Ah, oh, I'm sick of this. He throws a phone book. Somebody call anybody out of that book to get him off stage. <laughs> anybody. <laughs> the crowd's laughing. Just, I just remember looking at the phone book, picking it up. <laughs> Thank you, good night. I was supposed to do 20 minutes. I did two. Because I walked out there, I blacked out, and apparently on stage I went, that's all people heard. And then I, ran, I didn't say goodnight, I ran off stage, and then I blacked out and I woke up in a, in a white, like, green room that was brightly lit, and my agents started laughing. I have no shirt on. I had been crying, and they're like, what, I go, what happened? They go, you walked up on the stage and you just start going, ah, bah, 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 you know? And I go, why? Why did I do that? Because you know what happened was, I started eating it, and I, there was the first time, and the last time it's ever happened, where like, a sense of like, my body went, you have to protect yourself, because you can't deal with this. This is like being raped, like in prison. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if I was ever raped in prison, I would never talk about it. And I would say that people, I was never raped. No, that didn't happen. You know what I mean? Because you're, you can't, the, 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 you know, the humiliation is too much for the human mind to deal with. A real boo is usually start off like, you hear one person like, ah, and then you hear another person say, boo. And then it's quiet and they give you another joke. And then you hear, oh, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> now, here comes everybody. Oh, boo. Oh, boo. Ah, get the fuck out of here, bitch. Ah, boo. Next, boo. I was like, wow, I didn't even say nothing. I was like, it's my birthday, boo! They booed me harder because it was my birthday. I thought that was rude. I heard this chant start of off, off, off. And I, you know, when you look to the right, like a Scorsese Zoom, someone going off, off. You look at someone else going off, off. And I looked at the back and my wife was there. She was going off, <laughs> off, off. And I came off, I said, what were you doing? She goes, I started this chant because you wouldn't come off. And I thought, let's go for dinner, it's not working. So she started the chant. 500 people in this audience at Christmas were just going, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. And I was like, ah. And all I could say was, but it's Christmas. And that's all I had. But it's, it's Christmas. Like, people care. Oh, God, oh, it was horrible. You're walking off the stage and you're walking towards the room and you still hear, and then they're laughing because somebody said something that's funny about it. Like, ah. And then all of a sudden, the host that goes out on the stage, he says something fucked up about you because the crowd's just dying laughing. It's like, oh, shit. I'm like, damn. And it's the slowest, you know, like cowboy walk off like everything is happening in slow motion you can just see like people looking at you like yeah motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you know it's the horror everything is slow motion like you know the the mic cord is like I started doing the jokes and could feel that thing where as a comic you start trying to speed up the material and then after 30 more seconds of that you realize, oh shit, I'm in trouble. 
And shortly after that, I realized I am bombing, right? And I didn't have the wherewithal to be able to embrace the bomb. I didn't have the tools to be able to silence the hecklers. And then after maybe two or three people got, you know, say, oh, we can control this. You know what I mean? The crowd realized that, well, we're part of the show, too. So if this guy isn't giving us what we want, then fuck, we'll give ourselves what we want, which is to get his ass off stage. And then it just, the surround sound kicked in. They started booing and it was, you know, it's like, and it was the only time where I physically put the microphone back in the mic stand and said, this is too much for me. And I took, it was the, it literally crushed me to take, that is a lot to put it back. And man, now thinking about it, shit. So, <laughs> it's funny. Um, Bernie Mac went out, and this dude was so gracious. He went out and told the audience that, you know, that that was a great comic, made me come back out, made them give me a round of applause. And uh, <laughs> it's funny, this is this actually a funny part to this story, so hopefully I can get to it. But show was over. <laughs> the, the, okay, I'll get to the funny part because it'll make this easy to tell. On the side of the stage is Richard Dent, Bo Jackson, and Michael Jordan. Fuck your life! It's Michael fucking Jordan, you just got booed off stage in front of motherfucker! Ah, right? So, after the show, uh, you know, show rest of the show is great, <laughs> you know? The rest of the show is phenomenal, right? And so, after the show, all of the other comics, there's all of this great energy, and they're all talking to Michael Jordan, and, and you know, high-fiving, and this laughter going on. And I'm off in the corner behind the theater curtain, like peeking out like this, you know, thinking to myself, Mr. Michael Jordan don't want to meet me. I got booed, right? And so I stayed away, right? I got robbed of an opportunity to have this great experience with, you know, arguably the greatest basketball player in history and these other wonderful people. And here's the kicker. That was the first show. There was a second show that night. So imagine what the experience is that you have to go out and do another show after that. It's like there's no oxygen and you can't stop. If you stop, you lose because we're all trying to just be who we are. You know, when you're a musician and you go up there, you've got songs that you or somebody else has written. If you're a painter, you've got what you did with paint. It's all there and it's separate from who you are. With a comedian, it's you. There is not, it's you. They don't not like your material. They don't not like the clothes you're wearing. They don't like you. It's about as personal as it gets. And it's really, really, really traumatic when you have those nights where it's, it, it, it hits you on an existential level. So not doing well as a comedian is not just having a rough day at work. It's an existential crisis. Now you're just in this room by yourself. And all the people who follow you to the room when you have a, when you have a good show, nobody's there. You're in the room by yourself. You're waiting to hear the door open for somebody to say, you're all right? And they never come to the door. It hurts more than going to your mother's funeral. Bombing, it hurts that bad. Driving back to New York City, I wanted to drive off the Tappan Zee Bridge. It was really bad. I mean, just terrible. Here's what bombing is. You jump out of a plane, you have a parachute, right? You pull the chute, it doesn't open. You go to the emergency chute, that doesn't open. Then you're looking down for a body of water or a haystack 
to land on and you try to flap your arms and you, you can't, you're just falling, falling, but you never hit the ground. You just fall and fall and fall. And when you walk off stage, you're still falling. You go out to the lobby, no one's looking at you, the club, oh, yeah. you're still falling. You get in the cab, you're still falling. You go home, you lay in a bed, you're still falling, falling. It's just this horrible, empty, dark feeling. You know what bombing feels like? Bombing feels like your dad slapping you in front of everybody at a barbecue. And then you gotta go sit down with your face burning and your eyes tearing up for no reason and pretend like nobody saw shit. And the whole time you're eating like this. Hey man, can you pass the, can you pass the mashed potato please? Like you ever got beat by your dad and a relative is watching you and you're like getting beat and you're watching them like this, but he can't help you? That's what bombing feels like, man. You really start looking at everything when you get booed off the stage. You can have 10 fucking good shows, but when they boo you off the stage, you start thinking about your future, like your finances. Fucking boo or do you like that? You get booed off the fucking stage, and you run straight home and start thinking about, damn, I might have to send this fucking furniture set back to rent a center. We can live in a on top of the mountain or bottom of the ocean type mindset. Uh, what I try to do is not notice it. Like, you know, if, if you tell a joke or, and you know me, I live at the bottom of the ocean, it's like, oh, I didn't think that went right. And so if, when I was younger, it used to just literally, it would kill me. And now I'm able to uh, float through it now because uh, I have money. <laughs> I have money. I'm very famous. Fuck it. Uh, but you got to concentrate on uh, 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 other things. And when you look at Robin Williams, God bless him, when you look at people like that who we, 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 we live for the thirst of laugh at us, you know, we need that. That's how we eat. And when you take that from us, you know, a little bit of us dies. Bombing is a necessary event. It's the only way one gets better, but every time it happens, it's very painful. You've got to die to get good. The more pain that you go through as an individual on that stage, the better you will probably get. Um, I mean, if you're experiencing regular pain without any kind of laughter, I would say retire. Bombing is the humbler, you know? Just when you think it's going great and then you start bombing, you're like, wait a minute, this is not right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not killing, I'm bombing. And then you have to do everything possible to get out of that hole. I like that. It gets to the point like driving a car. When you learn to drive a car, you think, well, I could hit anything at any point here. I'm just learning and I've just passed my test saying, whoa. But then there comes a point in your driving career where you don't think about that. You don't think that anything drastic and damaging and dreadful is going to happen because you, you know how to get out of fuck up. When you bomb when you're young, it's devastating because you don't have the, the necessary skills to keep it going. You can bomb when you're older, and they don't even know you're bombing. Or only you know you're bombing. Because you're a professional, and you use every trick of the trade. I took so many, man. So many. Like, I'm, I'm so prepared for anything bad. There's nothing bad that can happen to me that I'm not prepared for. I've had to make a separation in my head between me and the, the comedian, Stuart Lee. And the comedian, Stuart Lee, thinks he's really brilliant. And that if, if he doesn't go really well, it's the fault of people for not appreciating his genius. So if he goes to silence, he walks off stage with his own self-belief actually strengthened. Obviously, on some level, I do think that as well. 
but I don't think as much as him. What it does make you do is it lets you know where the bottom is. And once you know where the bottom is, then you can know whether you can take it or not. So I tell comics all the time, you don't know if you can be a comic yet. You'll find out after you catch the worst boo of your life. If you can come back from that, then you'll be fine. If you can't come back from that, if that bothers you, if you gotta take a couple weeks off, you gotta, you gotta go to counseling, you gotta talk to somebody about it, you gotta, oh, you, you stressed out, you scratching and you, you're ripping up pages out your joke book, you won't be around that long. You can't take it. This guy, man, this is, he was up. Uh, I saw, I saw the documentary. Oh yeah. And I was like, oh, he really breaking it down. Cause they don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I go down into the green room, and there is another comic there, and he said. When you go out the next show, he said, go to the very front of the stage. And he said, stand on the front of the stage and do not move until you know you have full control of this audience. He said, if one person says anything, he said, I don't care if you can see them or not, whether it's a girl, boy, you make it who you need it to be. And you talk about them so much until their mother dies. And he said, in that way, the rest of the people in the room will know not to fuck with you. And it was probably one of the most important lessons I've learned doing stand-up. What's your name, sir? Leroy! <laughs> so, how did it work out, the second set? The second show had a great time. No Michael Jordan, though. He left. This is what I always tell somebody who wants to get into stand-up. It's really got to be a calling. It's really not worth it if it isn't a calling. It is too painful and too difficult if it isn't a calling. We all have our dark parts of our lives, whether you're poor, whether you have something. Everybody has something to draw from that is pain in their life that makes them funny. Right when I usually, when I pull up to the place, I just look at it and I, look, and I visualize everyone inside laughing. And then I go, then I laugh a little bit. <laughs> and I go, I am funny. I am hilarious, I'm talented, I'm special, and if nobody else notices it, that's because they're slow. Something's wrong with them. For me, it's every time I get on stage, it's a dream come true. Because I never thought that I could this could happen for me. I mean, I'm telling you, when I was 13 years old, I knew I was going to jail. I knew I was gonna go to jail and I knew I was gonna be somebody baby mama because that was my reality. That's what I saw around me. I was getting in trouble every day in school and my social worker was like, look, Tiffany, you got two choices. You can either go to the Laugh Factory Comedy Camp or you can go to psychiatric therapy. Which one do you wanna do? I said, well, I'll go to the comedy camp. And it changed my life. When you're in foster care and you're being moved from house to house, when you feel like, my mama don't love me, she just care about herself. You know, my dad, he's running from the law, he don't care about me. My brothers and sisters hate me. You know, my stepdad thinks I'm stupid and dumb, nobody loves me. And then you get to be a part of something, like, and it's people, it's people there, those men there, I don't even think they realize how they encouraged me and helped me so much because I didn't have any men in my life saying, you're beautiful, you're talented, you're funny, you're smart, you can do anything. Like that, those eight weeks were the most amazing eight weeks of my entire life. That was sort of foundation for who I am today, you know? Like, and, and it, yeah. Comedians are damaged people. They've uh, gone through a lot of painful experiences in their life. And they're very vulnerable people. The shield is, ha, 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 I can laugh at this. But that doesn't change the pain. 
So when these guys go back to their life, that pain is still there. Like if I make it through like a couple of steps of the day, I'm like, fuck yeah. You know, basic ass shit. Like if I make it out of the door by 1130 a.m., dude, come on, man. It must be Christmas, son. Because you're a fuck up. What weirdo would say I need to stand in front of two, three, four hundred people a night and get them to laugh at me so I can even feel like a regular person enough so I can go to bed? Everybody else just watch a little bit of Modern Family and that's a wrap. Yeah. We're doing all this bullshit. I have to drive somewhere to get approved from people I don't even fucking know and then leave. Dude, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't bomb a lot. I bomb very rarely. I bomb in life. I bomb in fucking life. I'm right now. I'm bombing right now. Uh, uh, I, I go on stage. People laugh heartily. They they say that you know this, there's something behind your jokes, there's substance. And then I sometimes I gotta ask for a swipe to get on the subway because I don't have two dollars and fifty cents. So I I suffer from depression. I I don't. Um, I, I, you know, <laughs> I've been diagnosed with several different types of depression on and off, and I don't know which ones to believe. Um, but no, I, I definitely have depression, but I've had, I had that before I was a comedian. I don't think comedy ever caused that in my life. And I also, I know a lot of people who don't suffer from depression at all. It's just, I believe that maybe comedy gets labeled with the, we're all manic depressives because. It's the only occupation where you're allowed to constantly talk about being a manic depressive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Any group of people that think for a living is going to be sad. You know, we always say ignorance is bliss, right? So what's the opposite? You know, because you can't be, there's no great ignorant comedians. You've got to be aware of everything. So knowing, you can know too much. But uh, I mean, manic depressive, nah. But definitely not as happy as the average idiot, yeah. <laughs> I use comedy, I suppose a lot of people do, to, to mitigate pain, I think. And it, that's why people who come from uh, slightly dysfunctional backgrounds are better at comedy. You know? I think well-adjusted, you know, uh, I don't know many well-adjusted spiritual people who are funny. It would be very rare to find a good comic who had not felt disenfranchised from something or disconnected. That, you know, you are looking, you're looking at a group, you're looking at a world and you're not part of it, you're looking through the window. And that's why I think there's, a, there's some quite bland comics around who feel like they're in the group, who feel like they're in a golf club, whereas the ones I really like are just a little bit odd. I think we are, we are the odd people and that's how we fit in by showing our oddness. A lot of the great comedians have used their own significant pain that they've had in their lives. And See, that's the problem with me. I didn't grow up one of them niggas where my, we didn't have, we was eating shoes and shit and my daddy kicked us out. <laughs> I was like, we were born in Mississippi. I was a spoiled fat kid from San Diego, you know? So I was just, I didn't have a bad life. I was the bad part of the life. I was just like, here this nigga come. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I didn't have, I had a great, you know, my father drove a Jaguar in 76. So he was selling cocaine, but <laughs> we had a great life. <laughs> Comedy is probably the reason why I'm not crazy. Like they say, most comedians are crazy. I can say on paper, I'm not crazy. And I, like, I've really, I laugh at the fact that I can say that because as comedians, we're supposed to be. We should be. We're on stage, we talk to ourselves, we look around as if other people were there when we're talking, we respond to what we just said. It creates a world for us. That's a, it's a safe haven on stage. And no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're talking about, it's okay at that moment. I don't know anything else because stand-up has been a part of my life for like 18 years performing. And it's the number one thing in my life. The reason why I've never had kids and I never had a wife was because of stand-up, you know, because, I mean, I love the girlfriend I have now and she's wonderful. She really is, I love her. But the kind of love I have for stand-up is completely different, you know? 
And I don't think any human being can replace that love. And I'll do it to the end of time. It's kind of like, I feel like there's so many things that are just like a way you choose to live your life. It's like, all right, I'm gonna choose to keep doing this. And it's definitely not like a great way to invest in your romantic life, this career path. But I feel like if you have the capability to, to do this, you gotta do it. I love my family, I love my wife, I love my children. But it's, <laughs> it's it is a, I, the, 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 the last Christmas my children made this uh, collage of, uh, for Christmas and it had, it was for me and it was a tape. And every single one of those uh, scenes I was almost not in. From the time they were very little to going off to college to coming home. And I should have been sad, but I knew I was gone doing something that I loved and I was okay. And, and, I, and I felt horrible that I felt that I'd done the right thing. When you have a job that's fun, that's your dream job, and then you have someone in their life who isn't doing their dream job, which is 99% of the population, 99% of the world go to work and they do it. It's, it's not called play, it's called work, and you go there to earn money, and the people pay you just enough so you keep on coming back. And that's the level of pay that people have paid, enough that you'll come back, right? And when you've got someone who's in a job like that, and you're in a job where you love it, resentment does set in, I find. That and the cheating. <laughs> I have treated stand-up with, with a certain amount of ingratitude, considering what it gave me, because it, it changed my life completely. I was, I was, you know, I was just a drifter. I had no idea what I was going to do for a living, and, and I was living in a, you know, a bed sit. And stand-up changed everything for me, and I really, believe in it. I believe that it, you know, it needs to be done properly and to be done with proper respect. For, for the, for, I think for the best stand-ups, what's great is when it's um, about something. When comedy is used to shed some light on the human condition and uh, reveal something truthful. Comedian's job is to say the things that everybody's afraid to say. You know, you're, you're, you are everybody's inner thoughts. You are their son, you are their conscience, you know. So uh, whatever you're afraid to say, we're our job is to say it. I think comedy, to an extent, I hate to say it's innocent, but to an extent, it's a space that people created to go. What would happen if we took the rules away? And now we're in a position where shouldn't we have some rules over there? <laughs> you're like, well, no, this is a space where there's no rules. Um, but also, it's just a way of looking at it. Maybe you're conditioned into a way of looking at the world. So I see everything as jokes, I see everything as comedy. I mean, if, if you say you, you don't want to hear that, that's fine. If you say you don't want me to see it, you know, that's, I was going to say that's obscene, but that's actually funny as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, this may sound, this is the danger of it, this is the danger of talking about it, you sound like a wanker. But um, there's a congregational element, there's an element of people needing to go to, to see someone to either explain the world to them or talk about the world or, or see if some of their experiences are reflected there and they're, and, and they're in touch with that. I think people enjoy it from that perspective as well. You could have a crowd of people, a huge crowd of people, who are all disparate politically and um, in terms of their taste and their class. Uh, they're all from different backgrounds, different different uh, people, different out outlooks on life. But if you make them all laugh at the same time, then suddenly all those people, all the things that make them different sort of vanish. And, and at that one moment of laughter, they're all united. They all agree. Because if you all laugh, you're all agreeing on one thing, that that thing that just happened was funny. And that's really incredibly powerful thing. This is driving 150 miles an hour in your car. This is being at full tense you know, full focus, I'm 100% in, I can't make any mistakes, the, the wheel is shaking, but I got it. 
That's what stand-up comedy is. You're right in this pocket. Oh shit, a turn's coming. Here's the turn. I gotta, I gotta hold this turn down. And that's, and 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 that is a rush that you cannot explain. You can't prepare for. You get used to it because you can expect it. But it's still like it's a, it's it's a feeling that you get used to, like sex. Okay, you know what sex feels like. Okay, but does that mean you had enough? Of course not. And that's the feeling that you get when you're on stage. It's like, wow, this is <laughs> some good ass sex. It's kind of changed my life and my faith. <laughs> uh, but the thing that is really amazing to me is that moment where you take the mic out of the stand. When I walk out anywhere, and I just did a couple gigs last week, and I really loved them because it's a relationship with that audience, and it's it's a date. I mean, it's a. It's a special moment to me, every single one of them. But I'm trying to get this perfectly symphonic um, blend of what I think, what I say, my voice, my body, my face, the words, get it all to blend in this perfect way. And then the bit comes out and it's perfect. And, and, and you hear that right away that it's, yes, they will say right away, that's, you got it. I can hear, I know what that laugh is supposed to be. And when it goes up a little bit, I know that I did it better that time than I usually do it. And that's what I live for. It's magical, you know. I mean, when all the pieces fit together and you walk out and audiences, they know who you are, they know what you're about, they know what you mean to yourself, what you mean to culture, and more than, more, more, even more so, what you mean to them. And when they love you and, and you're there for them and you connect with them, it's, you know, it's a little bit of, you know, perfection. Stand-up is kind of like a ding, 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 like those old beach movies and you put the, put the board in and you ding, 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 you get up and you're finally riding the thing, you're finally riding it, you're finally riding it, and then whoosh, you're in the tube and you're like, joke, wow, laugh, joke. Laugh. Got that joke? Laugh. Joke. Laugh. Good night. Honestly, we you know what feels good to me is like when I'm in the middle of a show. I'm in like literally, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a half hour in, you know, 40 minutes in. I'm killing. And I'm looking at the crowd, and I'm like, you motherfuckers ain't heard shit yet. <laughs> I love the feeling of it. I love the feeling of the, the the timing of it, the setup, the setup, the punch, the laugh, the setup. Like, there's something about getting into that rhythm that feels so good. When a comedian is on and you tell that joke and it goes to the back of the house and it comes roaring back to your face, there's nothing like that uh, that feeling. Your skin crawls about that high, goose flesh, from your fingertips right to your toes. You can't tell that to anybody because they don't know what you're talking about. But I know what it feels like. Pumps the heart in a different way. Head feels different, eyes light up. Cells in your body all of them go like this, like yeah. They all ring like bells, yeah, yeah. And it could be 10 people or 10,000 people. Uh, but when you feel that, when you make people laugh, there's nothing like that feeling. That laugh is better than any trophy or any stupid parchment. All the heralding, the awarding, the trumpeting, the lauding, who cares? Who cares? You're a comedian, that, that's your award.